Welcome back to Shattering Mists. Uh, the following line comes from Yahweh. Uh, it is a uh, uh, indicative of the way that he personally engages relative to the covenant. Now, the previous uh, statement that Yahweh had made in Barashit the Twelve had uh, Yahweh saying, and I will choose to genuinely and consistently uh, engage uh, with you for the purpose of continually increasing and magnifying people from different races and places. Now, the next line from Yahweh explains how he's going to do that. And it is, it is so profound. It is, it is literally the antithesis of most people's perspective on God, and particularly the religious perspective on God. He says, and I will, of my own volition, consistently kneel down in love, lowering myself to bless and benefit you. Wabarak. Profound, isn't it? Yes, it is. It has God on his knees lifting us up, as opposed to us getting on our knees to lift up God in praise. Yeah, it's, it's the opposite of religion. Right. The opposite of the Islamic religion where they pray five times a day and, and, and moon God while, you know, banging their heads uh, against the uh, the ground. I am so stupid. I am so stupid. I am so stupid. Well, I guess you'd need to do that five times a day. And, uh, and the Christian religion, which uh, it, the only places where Christian religion is not dying is in these... Uh, praise-oriented evangelical circles where they're, um, you know, on their knees lifting up their God in, uh, in praise. And there's two aspects of this that are just fundamentally um, absurd, uh, right at the, the heart of it. And the first is something you talk about a lot. I think the thing that really resonated with you, Larry, more than anybody else when you came to... Uh, to leave religion and embrace the truth, is that a God who would create a being for the purpose of telling him how wonderful he is, is not a, a being that you want to know. Why would you want to know a being that says, you know, I'm going to create you for the express purpose of you constantly telling me how wonderful I am. I, I want you on your knees, afraid of me, groveling before me, lifting me up in praise, telling me how wonderful I am. Can you imagine? Powerful, powerful beings, powerful people even don't need that. No. No, you know, once you get to the point in life where you, you know who you are, you're comfortable with who you are, and uh, the last thing you want is somebody telling you you're, uh, you're wonderful. It, it's, in fact, it's, it's irritating. Because you know that the person saying it uh, doesn't actually think it to be true. They're just doing it because they want to be on your good side. Uh, it's well, it's I mean, I, I can imagine that very few people know that at the level you do. You know, yeah. uh, you were you were worth your company that you owned was worth several billion dollars at one time. Yeah, a lot of people listening to this may not know that, but that's that's uh, Yada's work. And uh, prior to doing real work, <laughs> mm -hmm. I should say. Probably. Yeah, this is this is a lot more rewarding. Don't get paid for uh, for this, but I want to tell you that the uh, the perks that come along with uh, with working uh, with and in conjunction with Yahweh and communicating His word is so much more with rewarding than anything I've ever point, done in my past. The point being, you've had your ass kissed many Boy, times. Boy, have I ever! And I want to tell you, I've, I was trying to convey this without mentioning that, but the reality is it's revolting. And the religious God, this God who wants that, is despicable. That kind of a God would be grotesquely insecure. An insecure well, person wants you to tell them all the time how wonderful they hell. are. Right. Yeah, love me or burn in hell, you know, uh, which, which right, there, right there makes them unlovable. Right. Now, the second part of this, though, is, is the, the flip side of it is that, so while bowing down to praise a, a God cannot be the purpose of any God worth knowing, the other side of it is just so marvelous in its, in the, in its simplicity. And that is, our Heavenly Father wants nothing more than to help His children. 
He wants to lift his children up. He wants to engage with his children. He, he wants to enrich his children's lives. And, and it, the, the greater the individual, the more they're willing to, to diminish themselves for the purpose of lifting someone else up. And, you know, that's really how we grow. Uh, you know, you've, you have a family. You know that every time that you have done something where you've made a sacrifice that is beneficial to your daughters and to your son, something marvelous results. There, there's things that you're going to know as a parent that there is no way you would ever learn them if you weren't a parent. I mean, right. that's what I would say. Right. Because and as a parent. Just the growth that comes along with being a parent. You know, right. I mean, there's growth involved, period. You know. And so this is actually how God grows. And it's this uh, this realization, and you don't really understand it until you are a, uh, a parent, but this realization that when we make a sacrifice of ourselves and we get down on our knees to lift our children up, we actually grow. We're never taller. We're never greater than we are when we're on our knees then embracing and lifting our children and and the old thing you know if if, if you're not growing you're you're dying Correct. you know and it's the same thing we see it in businesses don't we if your business yes. isn't growing it's dying and the same and thing is true with god god you, needs to grow he needs to grow to be infinite he needs to grow to enjoy his existence he needs to to grow because the antithesis of growing is to die and it is why his plan for us is for us to grow eternally, to always be more than we were the, the moment before. And the way that happens is God of his own volition consistently kneels down in love, lowering himself to bless and to benefit us. It's yeah, the, and again, it's the purpose he's of the covenant. kneeling down. And he's kneeling down every time. He's kneeling down to help Abraham and Sarah. He's kneeling down and he's blowing the Sama in Adam's nostrils. This, yes. this, is, this is the whole, as you say, antithesis of, of, of religion. Because in religion, you're bowing your head. You're solemn. You're, uh, I, I don't know what, you're, right. you're putting on right. some kind of act. Yeah, like in a Catholic church, there's there's kneeling boards uh, in the, the pews, so you can constantly bow down. But while it is the antithesis of religion, this is also the synthesis of the covenant. God getting on his knees, diminishing himself to lift up his children, is the synthesis of the covenant. When you recognize that the covenant has five benefits, and those five benefits are all facilitated by Yahweh on his knees, the literal yeah. depiction of Yahweh on his knees is Yahusha. Yahusha is the diminished manifestation of Yahweh, of Yahweh diminishing himself so that he can lift us up. And it is Yahweh on his knees that facilitates the promises of the covenant, which is to make us immortal, to make us perfect, to adopt to us into his family, to enrich us and to empower us. Yeah, and that's and so, that's where it's at, and and that goes back to where we found the mercy in the Torah. <laughs> that's what, it's the most freeing document of all kind of right. all time, because it has its author serving humankind. The author of the Torah, Yahweh, is the servant of humankind. He is the one willing to do this, and he does it through individuals like. Abram, like you, like me. Yeah, um, <laughs> like me. Yeah, well, one of the one of the things people really, really need to understand, though. I mean, above all things, if they're going to get the nature of Yahweh, he doesn't say obey. He says listen, right. understand. Right. Right. And, and and Torah doesn't mean law. <laughs> no. And yeah, if you look guy, at the first uh, this first statement to um, issued to Abram. Yahweh, after identifying himself by name, asks him of his own free will to walk away from his country and to, and to walk to the place that Yahweh was providing. And so God said, I'm going to provide this wonderful thing for you. I'm going to ask you to walk away from where you are to walk to me and with me to this wonderful place that I am providing. This uh, place is, is known as heaven. Uh, and that's the nature of all of this in the, in the Torah. It's, it's guidance and instruction 
that we can choose of our own volition to embrace, to act upon, or to reject. It's not a choice. Actually done out of trust, which is right. a whole different issue. Yes. For right. example, just along these lines, uh, you and I would both claim to be Torah observant. That is not yep. to say that we obey rules. It's to say that we closely examine and carefully consider what Yahweh had to say in his Torah. And to observe means to closely examine and carefully consider. And that, it, that uh, leads to good decisions, by the way. I mean, that's what does. happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you end up making good decisions, but the most important decision that you end up making is you, when you observe the Torah, you come to know Yahweh as our Heavenly Father who is on his knees to lift us up. He's not a God to fear, but a God to embrace, a God whose hand you want to grasp so that he can lift He's us up. He's there to help you. He's not there to hurt you. And his nature is, is that of, of wanting to be known as an individual, greeted, welcomed as an individual. He is not a religious deity. That, you know, that was one of the, uh, w when I first came to understand who Yahweh was, it was reading, you know, yada yada. And uh, when I got to where I, I'd read the part where, where he says, all fear of me is man-made. Right. And then I realized, okay, so all the copy edits that say, you know, fears of beginning and knowledge or serve right. me with great fear and shape, trembling and all this, right. these are all copy edits. Because if I said all fear of me is man-made, and then I said, fear me, that would be Larry made, wouldn't it? Right, of course. And, but and, but you know, there's another thing that's, equal, that's, than I am. That's, an, that's <laughs> equally profound on that same topic, and that is the copy edits of, uh, of Yahweh's testimony that replaced his name with Lord. Because right. as Yahweh, he is an individual with whom you can relate. I call him Yah. He likes the, the, the short and familial version of his name as Yah. But if he is a Lord, and if I call him Lord, then all of that is torn asunder. Lords do not get down on their knees. Lords do not lift up, they suppress. Lords are to be feared. Lords control. Lords are to be obeyed. The moment you refer to our Heavenly Father Yahweh as the Lord, then you've lost everything, then your perspective is upside down and backwards. We'll return in a moment. Welcome back to uh, Shattering Myths. One of the uh, great myths in, uh, in translating uh, the Torah um, is that there is a right and a wrong way to uh, to communicate the meaning of a word in the sense of of Barak very simplistically uh, does mean bless, but if you simply leave it at that and you don't consider the uh, root of Barak, its uh, etymological history then you would miss the vast preponderance of what is being communicated here. Uh, and there are lots of uh, Hebrew words which convey the idea of providing unmerited favor better than Barak. You know, I, Chen I, is the Hebrew word, Chen and Chanan, uh, is the Hebrew word and verb and noun that conveys providing mercy, the, uh, this, this undeserved favor. And God didn't use Chanan here. Now, he, he's a big advocate of Chanan. He uses it all the time in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. He did not use it here. And so if you think of, uh, of blessing as providing somebody with something that is undeserved and fortuitous, uh, he, then you're really looking at the Hebrew word chanan, but, but it wasn't selected here. So why was Barak selected here? And particularly since Barak's primary etymology conveys to kneel down, 
to kneel down to extol someone, to bless someone, to to benefit someone. You're kneeling down uh, for the express purpose of benefiting another, and you're doing so in love. And when you realize just how essential that is to the to understanding a God who does not want to be considered a Lord, but who wants to be considered a Father, the moment you embrace that, you understand the covenant. You know Yahweh. I mean, a child is presented with these insights, all gleaned from the Torah itself, can understand who God is and what he's offering and how we can relate to him. And yet the greatest mind and scholar in the universe, deprived of these insights, will never understand. Very few concepts uh, in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms that are more important than uh, fully appreciating, coming to embrace the full benefit of the words that God chose to convey to us, as well as to understand the merits of the Hebrew grammar that's applied to them. And in this particular case, Barak was written in the imperfect and the cohortative. And Larry, as we know, the, the imperfect means that the benefit here is ongoing, as is the, uh, as is the behavior. So Yahweh is not just saying, you know, I'm going to get down on my knees once, and I'll diminish myself once to lift you up by and using I'll take the care of you for eternity. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah, it's a never-ending behavior. That's what the imperfect and the the result, because you know all Hebrew verbs have a stem that is associated with them, and the stem establishes a relationship between the subject and the object. This is the 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 uh, the subject here is Yahweh. The object is us. And so it's an ongoing benefit, an ongoing act that benefits us throughout time. That's what the imperfect conveys. So rather than, than, you know, Hebrew or English verbs that are stuck in time, past, present, or future, by writing this in the imperfect in Hebrew, God is saying, I am always, consistently, continually going to kneel down to uh, bless and benefit you, and the benefits are ongoing throughout the entire fabric of time. And then, and while, while that's essential, and it's something that is almost universally ignored in published Bible translations, the, uh, the conjugation, the perfect or the imperfect, so is the uh, cohortative. And the cohortative is the principal expression of volition. It's a mood. Almost all of the moods in Hebrew express volition, their free will. But it's not just volition, it's also desire. So this is saying, this is what God chooses, volition. This is what God wants, desire. And if you don't convey the, the purpose of the cohortative mood, if you just leave that and ignore it, then you're missing the fact that God is saying, what I really want to do as your father is to get on my knees to lift you up, my child. This is what I choose to do. This is what I want to do. This is what I desire. And the moment you then equate that with God's statement, He becomes knowable, His plan becomes understandable, and we're in a position to respond. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. There is a direct correlation between Yahweh saying, and I will of my own volition constantly, consistently kneel down in love, lowering myself to bless and benefit you, Wabarak, and Yosha. Once you come to realize the nature of, of the, the relationship between energy and matter, uh, Einstein defined it as energy equals matter times the uh, the square of the speed of light, which means that matter is this exactly the same thing as energy, just a hugely diminished version of it. 
That is to say that if uh, you had the entire Pacific Ocean and you put a bucket uh, uh, into the Pacific Ocean and you drew out a bucket of water, the water in the bucket would be identical to the Pacific Ocean, just a hugely diminished representation of it. The moment you begin to recognize that as a corporeal manifestation of God, that Yausha, the Masaya, is Barak, the whole picture that God is painting for us becomes clear. That for God who equates himself to light right at the beginning of his oratory to us, his witness to us, light is a pure form of energy. And once we recognize that for energy to manifest itself in a material way, that energy has to be hugely diminished. So part of God's energy, set apart from him, diminished to become corporeal, to become physical. That is God on his knees. God lowering, diminishing himself to lift us up out of love. Yeah, and I do think that you have to understand that to get the picture. You have to. Yes, you really do. But there's a reason. There is a reason as an example that in in, in the uh, Tanakh, Yahushua is called not the Son of God. He's called the Son of Man. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if they wanted to say the Son of God as in an actual son, just the son, they they would have said it. But right. he's he's the Son of Man. In other words, <laughs> this is... Uh, this is, is God in, in man's form. Right. You know? Yeah, a lot of people that are uh, particularly uh, Muslims that uh, want to poke uh, holes in Christianity will say, you know, he doesn't call himself the son of God. He calls himself the son of man, speaking of, uh, of this misnomer of, uh, of Jesus. And there's a reason for that. Uh, a child was born to us, and that child was a son of man. Uh, the thing that made Yosha, the corporeal manifestation of Yahweh, is the set-apart spirit of Yahweh, was upon us, making it possible for God to give us, for our benefit, his representation on earth, the one representing him, the one coming in his name, Yosha. And so, the moment you come to, to understand what set-apart means, and how to go from from energy to matter, one has to be diminished, and that Paul lied when he said that the fullness of the Godhead was on him bodily, which is an, an absolute scientific impossibility. You recognize that Yosha is nothing more and nothing less than a diminished corporeal manifestation of Yahweh. And that's means exactly that, what Yahweh said he was. And further, uh, when, when you understand that he is a diminished manifestation of Yahweh, you understand Yahweh leads from the front. Right. <laughs> Thou shalt lead from the front. Right. Put, it, put it like that. Right. But also, when God says, I'm going to get on my knees to, uh, to lift you up, this diminished corporeal manifestation of Yahweh is God on his knees. Yahweh on his knees is Yahusha. That's right. This is the means that he is using to do this. Even when uh, Yahweh and uh, Abraham had uh, meals together, they walked together, they talked together, they drank together, they laughed together, they had meals together. During that time, uh, Yahweh manifest himself in Abram's presence as three individuals, three-ish, which means that he manifests himself as the Father, the Son, and the set-apart spirit, all taking on a corporeal form to eat and drink with Abram. That's the, I never really I, thought of that. Yeah, I, he, I, he says, I, I, he, he, says I'm, I'm, he met with him as, as three individuals. And they walked yeah. together, they talked together, they ate together, they drank together. Even when the Torah is being revealed to Moshe, you have Yahusha specifically there, called out by name, being there. And you have uh, Moshe eating, drinking, singing, talking with a corporeal manifestation of Yahweh. Right. Which and is so, amazing because you got the rabbis saying, you know, Yahweh can't take a corporeal form, which is... Uh, 
you know, Boy, really in opposition hard, to the Torah for sure. Right, really hard to eat, really hard to drink, really hard to talk, unless you have a corporeal form. It's really hard for Yahweh to etch his uh, ten statements in stone on those two tablets with a finger that he doesn't have. <laughs> right? You know, uh, I do. He, um, Yahweh manifests himself as the uh, as the pillar cloud during the uh, the day to lead the children of Israel uh, through the wilderness. That's a material, corporeal manifestation. Yahweh could manifest himself in any way he wanted to. Right. You know, was that the entirety of Yahweh? No. Was the entirety of Yahweh the, the burning top of uh, Mount Horeb? No. Was the entirety of Yahweh manifest in Yahusha? Absolutely not. That's why Yahusha never said, I'm going to do this for you. What he said is, I will ask the Father, and the Father will provide this for you. You know, that's why Yosha said, don't pray to me. Communicate with the Father. You know, begin by saying, our Father who is in heaven, our heavenly Father, set apart is your by name. The way, by the way, you're, you're talking about set apart, which is an extremely important subject. Right. And yet that's been plastered over with what? The religious notion of holy. Correct. You know, and acting you know, pure, religious right. acting. Right. Yeah. Holy is a is a purely religious term. It has no meaning apart from its religious orientation. And this is not a small issue. Just like Barak is, is central. You know, the moment you understand that God wants to be on his knees to lift us up, then you see Father and you now recognize that he can never be a Lord. And the moment you see uh, Yahusha, is Yahweh on his knees to lift us up, the diminished corporeal manifestation of Yahweh, then you no longer focus on Yosha, but instead on Yahweh. And it, the whole thing falls into place. But the same thing is true with set apart. The moment that Kodesh, which is the one of the most repeated Hebrew words in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, is understood as set apart, and you understand what set apart means, then the picture all comes together. The spirit is well, set, set apart. apart from somewhere. You Correct. Know. The, pair, the spirit is set apart from Yahweh, which and to be set apart means that the set apart spirit is part of Yahweh, set apart from Him to provide a service to us. It's not a separate individual. It's part of. She is part of Yahweh. And the, the son Yosha is called Kodesh Kodesh. That means uh, either most set apart or uh, completely set apart or set apart twice. And why would why would the why would Yosha be referred to as Kodesh Kodesh, where the spirit is routinely referred to as the Ruach Kodesh, or spirit that is set apart, and Yosha is referred to as Kodesh Kodesh, twice set apart. Well, because he's set apart, and then again he's diminished. Correct. In, in, Trans, uh, is this transfer from energy to matter? You could not be near pure energy. If if you or I were near any pure energy form, what would happen to us? Well, in, in, in any enough, any significant yeah, in any significant intensity, for example, if if Yahweh, whose whose energy is uh, sufficient to create the entire universe, then it should it should. Uh, uh, should I, I'm not going to speak for you, my, my friend, but should I uh, approach that much energy without the benefit of, uh, of being energy myself? I'd be toast. Yeah, It'd be right. instant, instant annihilation. By the way, that's exactly what's going to happen. When Yahweh returns, when right. he returns. He discusses it in Zachary Yahweh. Yeah, he says. Will, will right. melt their sockets, their tongues right. will liquefy, right. and who right. will? Right. Anybody who's not covered in what? Know, right. Then they are, as you say, toast. Because when he arrives, he's going to be taking care of business. You know. Right. Yeah, but that's not Yahweh killing them. It's just that exposure to God uh, will and, melt them. Uh, will, will will literally evaporate uh, a corporeal individual that isn't prepared to be in the presence of that kind of energy. And the purpose of 
of the covenant, the benefits of the covenant, what God is doing when he kneels down in love to benefit us is he's preparing us to be in his presence. So when this enormous energy, and it's not going to be the totality of Yahweh's energy that's going to come to the earth, but but a much more representative percentage of his energy is going to come to reside with us. In an undiminished form, no less. Yeah, in, a, in a less diminished form, yeah, it's going to be, Yahweh is going to come back appearing like the uh, constellations, like constellations. Uh, like stars in the uh, in the universe, which which still is <laughs> is not the entirety of uh, of God, but but substantially less diminished. Those who have embraced the covenant have received the blessings of the covenant and therefore are prepared to be in the presence of such enormous light. And that's the only way you'll be prepared to be covered in the in the Kodesh Ruach or Ruach Kodesh. Correct. Correct. And and that's it. I mean that's there's no other way to to be able to deal with it. That's what had them to happen to Adam and Shawa, by the way. I mean, when uh, the reason they realized they were naked is why? Because the set apart spirit left them. They they weren't right. covered anymore in right. in, in the uh, Ruach. So it, she right. left and they whoa they were naked. Right. And those who are naked upon Yahweh's return, which is going to take place some uh, 20 years from now, on uh, no. on you know, the day of Yom Kippurim, the day of reconciliations in year 6000 Yah, which is 2033, happens to be October 2nd on our calendars, if you are not part of the covenant, if you haven't received these covenant blessings, then Yahweh's return will be, he's going to come back as so much light, so much energy, that uh, you won't survive it. And so there is a plan for you to survive it, but to do so, you have to act upon the covenant. So even though the concept of God bowing down to lift us up is the antithesis of what religions teach. Intuitively, it is rational. It is what God should want to do. It is what we should want of God. You know, imagine a God so insecure, so needy, he wants to beings created to grovel at his knees, repetitively telling him how wonderful he is. it's, uh, to put that in perspective, it'd be like uh, you, Larry, creating a uh, uh, a uh, on a plot of uh, of grass, a uh, a farm of garden slugs, uh, hoping that that uh, they would shrivel up in your presence and burp out uh, thoughtless platitudes. Uh, it would yeah, be, it, it just ignorant, and, and, yeah, and it would take. St- you wouldn't want to be around such a such a being. He would be no. mocking you. He's mocking right. you. Right. Days. That's right. It's like Allah in the Quran. He's always mocking his creation, always taunting his creation. And well, it's almost the perfect religion, though. Right. That's almost the perfect religion. It is. I, mean, I agree. I agree. Complete it's submission. You know. Not in the way that they mean it, but it is the world's greatest religion. You know that. But by the by Yahweh's definition, where a religion is pure evil. And it's the uh, the epitome of pure evil. God yeah, makes the grade, doesn't it? Just yeah. thoughtless, ritualistic prayer five times a day or three times a day, depending on what branch you're with. Yeah, just uh, total ignorance, total total submission. Yeah, I'm a slave. I'm your slave. No, no. It is uh, it is astonishing that uh, it is um, misinterpreted this way. You know, the the other thing that's, uh, that uh, is we just to reemphasize that is so important to understanding is the the stems conjugations and moods. Uh, it is by by evaluating them that we come to understand what God is is offering to us, uh, how He is representing Himself. For example, Barak was written in the peel stem. Now the peel stem, like all stems, shows the relationship between the 
the subject, uh, the action of the verb, and the object. So it's, it's a relationship between this idea of God getting down to lift us up with God being the subject and uh, us being the, uh, the object. Now what the peel stem does is it expresses the bringing about of a state. So the object of the verb's action, Abram and thus you and me, experience the effect of the verb's action which is to be blessed, to be favored, to, uh, to be uplifted. And with appeal, the verb subject, which in this case is Yahweh himself, is responsible for initiating this process. So it is God provi- initiating on his own volition this whole process of lifting us up. Uh, the appeal stem was the perfect relational concept to ascribe to this verb to convey what a father will do with a child. A, 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 a father, for example, doesn't wait for the child to, to express a need and then try to attend to that need. As a father, as a mother, as a parent, we initiate this process of sustaining and nurturing and protecting and uh, enriching yeah, our children. You don't put your child out when it's uh, uh, 10 below zero and let's say have a child on. Right, yeah. expect a child to uh, to come to you and say, oh, by the way, shouldn't you have provided me with a coat? Oh, you initiate right. the process. And that is what God is saying here, is that he's initiating the process. Now, that is really essential as it relates to the covenant. God, through his Torah, is initiating the process. He is introducing himself to us, just as he did to Abram. He's offering to to benefit us in this way, and is is offering this relationship to us. It's then our choice as to whether or not we choose to respond. But the process of the covenant has been initiated by God. He is offering the invitation. Now it's our decision as to whether or not we respond to that invitation. And so that is what the peel stem conveys. Of course, we we talked about the imperfect conjugation. That means that the favor that God is providing in this manner has benefits that unfold throughout eternity, and that God will always be this way. He isn't going to change. He isn't, he's saying that he was, he is, and he always will be willing to diminish himself to lift us up. Always willing to get down on his knees, to empower us, to enrich us. And, of course, the cohortative mood, which is just my favorite of all, which shows that this is God's will. It's what he wants to do. It's what he has chosen to do. Just as a loving father, he's motivated out of love to do what is best for us. Larry, thank you for participating today. We'll be back with Shattering Us at this time tomorrow. May God bless you all.